Welcome to Light Over Heat with Professor David Yamani. Today, I'm happy to bring you another conversation with an author of a book about guns in American society. In this case, it's Guns and Values by Dylan McLean and Anthony Fleming, two political scientists. So stay tuned for my conversation with Dylan McLean. Uh, Dylan McLean, thank you so much for joining me. I, I have your book, and I should also uh, pr probably apologize to your co-author, Anthony Fleming, who I haven't really been mentioning uh, in the context of this book, mostly because, you know, we've we've uh, met sort of uh, online and via the internet before, but I've, I've not met him, so I just associate this project so much with you, but I'm sure he contributed a lot to it also. Yeah, he did, and it was definitely a team effort, so we, we we get it. He's he's right down the hall, so he's he's sympathetic to. He okay. came over doing this. We've talked. We cool. We are um, aligned on many of these things. Yeah, that that's awesome. Uh, so you know, could just begin by uh, sort of summarizing the main contribution uh, of the work for a potential reader, and particularly, you know, I have a lot of people who follow you know, my channel who are not academics. They're fairly well read in, in the world of guns, but you know, what what is uh, the take the story for for the non academic audience? Yeah, so I think I think the big thing that I would encourage anybody to take away and hope anybody would take away from this book is that um, it's just a call to consider the gun debate on a much deeper level than we generally engage with it on. Right? So I think in a general sense, to me, whether the issue is guns or many other things, frequently as humans, what we're arguing about really isn't what we're arguing about so what i mean by that is um for example like just think about a couple arguing about money right i mean frequently that argument is not just about money right it's about values and what we're prioritize what we're going to use that money for it's not really about oh you spent five more dollars and i wanted you to spend this week it's it's something deeper um so i think um, that has broad applicability, but it absolutely applies to this issue. Yeah. Specifically in the book, we we argue and we show, I think, that um, when it when in terms of gun control, we might argue about policy, we might argue about crime statistics and efficacy and technical attributes of certain guns and what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. But I think frequently, not necessarily all the time, but frequently, what we're really fighting about our our values and yeah. even sometimes we're arguing about like whose values get to be reflected in policy so i i think anybody can take that away from this book yeah well you know that i think that's a, a great uh, takeaway and i it also sort of leads me to you know think about sort of starting points and i you know i always like to talk to other scholars about their pre-scientific intuitions going into projects because i know i've you know i that's a lot of the deep uh, meaning of the work that I do is, you know, ideas I had coming in. So did you have some, you know, sort of pre-scientific or pre-scholarly uh, ideas or intuitions in going into this project? Yeah, sure. A um, little bit of both, a um, little bit from some of my personal background, a little bit from some of my other academic work. Um, I have a background working on Canadian American political differences, especially differences in our political cultures and you know, the, the classic idea of Canada is this a little bit more collectivist society, U.S. a little bit more individualistic. And when you think about how that applies in the context of gun control and gun policy, you know, we see our arguments tend to reflect that. You know, and if you look at the Canadian argument, which I observed for a while, that they're effective making group-based arguments. Yeah. Gun control to protect women or gun control to protect children, like that works there. And it just seemed to me that that is actually how the rest of the world talks about guns, but it's not how we talk about guns, or it's at least not the argument that we have about it that tends to have the most policy success. So, I mean, I had a hunch that uh, if I dove into this, I, I would find more of that. Um, yeah. yeah, excellent. Um, and then, you know, uh, the other thing that often happens is we delve into the empirical world as we have those pre-scientific intuitions, but then, you know, our minds can change as we, 
we get into the nitty gritty of collecting data and analyzing data. So were, was, were there any ways in which your mind changed as you uh, went about the project? I'm not sure my mind changed all that much, but I, my mind expanded considerably. I'll put it that way. So um, I certainly expected to see a strong individualistic bias in the U S and I expected to see that reflected in our debate about guns. And I don't, I think your followers wouldn't be particularly shocked to to see that, right? Um, two things really opened my eyes. Number one, in the book, we take a really deep dive that would probably bore most normal human beings um, into the literature on individualism and just exactly what we mean by that. I, I wasn't prepared going in for the level of nuance that that would require. I, that's kind of interesting. And I think maybe our dialogue should explore that some more. Um, just in general, I think we could benefit from that. Um, the other thing that I really wasn't prepared for is the extent of the challenge to the, the dominant culture of individualism. It's, I think the bias is strong in American culture and throughout our history, but it's not the only story. Um, there have been the names, again, back to that deep dive. So how we label some of these challenges is up for debate. But the, the whether we call it communitarianism or collectivism or, or um, just less individualism, these these things have been challenged. And the periods where we, we see some strong challenges to it, we've seen some real movement on gun control along with uh, other issues. Right? Yeah. So some of our big... Um, changes in, in gun control, especially at the federal level, that coincided with Jonathan's Great Society programs in general, which were very sort of group oriented. Yeah, no, I, you know, these, uh, the individual communitarian uh, debate, debate was very lively, you know, when I was in college and graduate school in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, I think that suggests that these are, you know, really, really fundamental tensions that exist within our culture. Uh, and that you know, they're, they're continually uh, being hashed out and they're being applied uh, or manifested in, in various areas. So, uh, you know, I think that's wise to, to return to some of those deep themes and also it really, to me suggests, you know, and I wouldn't say irreconcilability, but it suggests, as you said, you know, the depth of, uh, you know, what's going on. Cause if you think it's just an issue of, you know, how do you feel about guns? You're probably not going to get at uh, it in, in a way that you know can help to to push the debate forward. Uh, yeah. What about um, anything that you think is a kind of easy to miss uh, a contribution of the book? Something that you know is is in there a little nugget that the the casual reader might miss. Well, I mean, I'm referring to myself, of course. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's I, I thought about this a little bit, and it's easy to miss because we didn't put it in there. So we actually, in a, in a book like this, particularly coming from political science, it would be common to dive into some political or policy implications of the work. And we didn't really go there. Um, and that was a, a, a choice that we made for a variety of reasons. Um, nonetheless, you know, as you know, when you get to a book project, when the end is in sight, sometimes you just you just want to be done. Yeah. Um, but there there are some real policy implications here that I think are worth thinking about. And they go back to the idea of recognizing that the divisions that we have on these issues are so fundamental. And as you said, maybe not irreconcilable, but maybe verging on irreconcilable in some respects. I think advocates on either side of this issue would benefit from really appreciating that. And instead of trying to stick your head in the sand and ignore it, maybe talk to your base, like engage with the idea that there are some real limits to our ability to talk to our tribe here. Um, how can we engage with the cultural environment that surrounds this issue, the values environment on its own terms? So the gun rights side has historically done a much better job at doing this think than the gun control side of this argument um they i think some of that as to their they have some natural advantages it's easier for them to make arguments that they can wrap with an individualistic american culture than it is for the gun control side 
that doesn't mean that the gun control side can't also make some arguments that are likely to be more persuasive than some of their historical arguments by embracing and understanding the cultural environment they operate in. So, for example, um, I think um, a lot of the the real hope for progress on reducing the harms that are associated with guns is actually completely outside of the realm of law policy and regulation, especially anything in any restrictive sense. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it will boil down to um, just cultural change and education. So one thing that if I was being asked to consult the gun control group, which I'm, I'm not sure I would ever be asked to do that, but if I was, I would encourage shifting tact to selling rather than telling, right? So if you think about policies in terms of you know, restrictions or bans, and th those are what you're telling. Um, Americans like to be sold, not told what to do. So I, I like to compare things to the, the anti-smoking campaign, right? Think about the, the last couple of decades, there's just been dramatic change on smoking in, in the U.S. and probably around the world, but I can mostly speak to the U.S. And a lot of that's really just resulted from education and slow, painful cultural change on the social acceptability of smoking. So there have been some regulatory changes on that front, but to the extent that there have been, many of them have been used to support those other aspects of education. So there's been regulation around um, what you can and can't advertise when it comes to tobacco. A lot of that relates to the education campaign on the issue. So why can't we do that with guns, right? So mm -hmm. for example, um, one of the controversial but less controversial common proposals with gun control deal with safe storage, right? Um, we could mandate that. We could make laws around that. We have laws like that. But we could also really engage with the gun culture and just make it incredibly unacceptable in that culture to store your guns irresponsibly. I think one of those is going to be a lot more consistent with traditional predominant American culture than the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love that line of thinking. And it it is uh, funny you start by talking about um, uh, the the kind of expectation almost that you have some policy recommendation just because you're talking about guns and that anything, every per person who studies guns has to have some sort of policy implications. Uh, and I, I'm asked that all the time myself, like, you know, what, what three policies would you recommend? And I'm like, I'm just trying to understand how it works. Right. You know, maybe someday I'll understand well enough how it works to make some policy recommendations, but I do, uh, you know, when I'm, forced you know that i kind of go down your path and i hadn't really thought about why but that uh, selling rather than than telling idea is pretty pretty strong and you know yeah. they do pick up a lot of people you know within the gun culture who are you know skeptical about external regulations but they're perfectly happy to encourage positive behavior around yeah. gun safety yeah you know one thing that i've seen observing this culture is um i'm sure you're familiar with the concept of a truck gun Right. So this idea that you know you keep something in your vehicle uh, and some of the dialogue around that issue has changed. And just in the past five or six years, I've noticed it's become more likely when you see the conversation in online forums. I've done a lot of work in online forums, just observing dialogue that happens there. If more and more frequently you're seeing that concept challenged, like, Someone mentioned a truck gun in the next post. Hey, man, I hope you have a lock on that. Or, hey, have you seen these cool safes that you can put in under your back seat? And that's really, really hopeful to me, right? There's no laws around that. That's just within the culture kind of policing itself. Right. Yeah. And with, you know, with the rise of concealed carry and a lot of people, you know, taking their guns off if because they're going into some place where you can't have a gun or whatever and then leaving it in there. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of, you know, your your car is not a holster. Right. Yeah. So, you know, this similar, yeah. similar language. In yeah. China. And that's a new phrase. Like yeah. that's, that's relatively new, that dialogue. Definitely. Um, yeah. The other thing, you know, I think about is um, using, I use the uh, drunk driving kind of uh, analogy as a way of, you know, thinking about cultural change, obviously, you know, drunk, drunk driving was, you know, always, you know, illegal, but the, the norms around it, were were different and uh you know so that fighting that cultural battle and we didn't 
you know, we didn't ban alcohol. We didn't ban guns. We just said these two things don't go together. That's right. Uh, and so I think that the, that's an arena and we're, we're kind of getting into, you know, I think some of what I, you know, like to think that the, this channel is called light over heat. And so that's a, a big emphasis. And, you know, do you think that your book fits in this uh, light over heat model or do we maybe sometimes we need some heat? How do you see your work in that framework? But I have, I'm a little conflicted on that. Um, on the one hand, my gut reaction is I I think our conclusions are actually fairly pessimistic on that front. I think we, we really document that this debate is so viscerally divisive and it's hard for me to see that fundamental dynamic changing. Um, that it, it's hard to see that, that middle ground. On the other hand, um, I think that maybe there's value in understanding that when it comes to this issue in particular, in many respects, no amount of light or heat is going to change minds. And just understanding that and really internalizing that by itself can result in some light that can turn away and just essentially surrender on some of these issues that will not get resolved through debate and find some issues that can be resolved and don't result in the heat. So, there, yeah. so I mean, so many of our arguments are just hot air venting, like they're not productive arguments. Right. So if we could accept that those are in fact pointless arguments and we get over 90,000 words that basically say that's what our gun debate boils down to, let's take all of that off the table and talk about some things that maybe we actually can have productive conversation on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just like to see, you know, people on, on either side recognizing that uh, you know, both sort of more individualistically oriented ideas and more uh, communitarian oriented ideas are both parts of the American tradition. And that, you know, just because someone holds a different set of fundamental uh, values or worldviews than you doesn't make them not citizens. And, you know, I really hate the, you know, the kind of uh, um, sort of turning turning people who disagree with us in, into enemies. And I I much prefer yeah. if you just turn turn the lights out and go go to our separate bedrooms <laughs> rather than you know sort of fighting and calling people names. Yeah, we we have a line in the book that's to paraphrase basically says you know, the American West involved involved the cowboy and a six gun and the wagon train. Right, it, it took it took groups and individuals. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, you know, one of the other things I've been thinking about a, a lot lately in, in my elder years here is uh, uh, giving advice to new scholars who are who are coming into the field. And, you know, we're I think both of us would are considered more veteran gun studies scholars. So do, do you have any advice for uh, either, you know, an older scholar who's thinking of moving in the field or particularly, I guess, uh, a younger scholar, maybe even a graduate student who's thinking, hey, maybe I should study guns. It's a hot topic. Yeah. So my co-author and colleague, Dr. Fleming, and I we recently had a conversation about this. And you know, we're both often asked, essentially, why can't we solve this? Why can't we solve this, this gun problem? Or why can't we get gun control? And the, the bottom line is, as, as you well know, there, there's just no easy answer for that question. Right. It's 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 just not simply a policy question right? from political science for perspective, for example. Uh, we can't just weigh the pros and cons and find the solution that I mean, it just doesn't, it's so much more complex than that. So what I would tell somebody is you need to be prepared to embrace that complexity if you're going to be successful in this field. Um, as social scientists, I think we're trained to simplify the complex reality of our world so that we can better understand its essence. Oh, X and Y explain Z. That's just exceptionally hard to do in this field. Um, I consider, for example, the. I think we're chipping away at it, but one time canonical explanation for American resistance to gun control basically boiled down to NRA plus institutions equals American resistance to gun control. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a far too simplistic explanation. So I think if, if someone's coming into this field, you need to be able to embrace the idea that understanding gun culture, understanding gun politics, understanding gun policy, it all begins with more general understandings of culture, of history, of institutions, of psychology, of so much more than just 
the gun culture itself. Yeah, and you know, just today I was uh, you know writing and thinking about the the what I call the paradox of guns, right? And that's as a, a sort of starting point, not to say that guns are either this or that, but really to recognize that guns are are both this and that, and you know, that's a I think captured in your you're saying that there's complexity here, right? It's it's not x plus y; it's you know x plus y plus z minus a multiplied by d, etc. Right? It's like a the the most complex uh, statistical model you can think of, and it doesn't even explain all the variants. So yeah, and I I think appreciating that would be particularly valuable to young. I'm I'm thinking of a young graduate student where the the pressure in that context is to to try and find that that regression equation, right? That's it. And it's, it's just hard. If you want to do this field, that that's hard to, yeah. to do that. Well, I think, you know, in, in closing, this is a little bit unfair because obviously this book just came out and, uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know what's next for you and, or your colleague, are you going to keep uh, plugging away in this field or have you had enough uh, of guns and you're moving on to, to greener pastures? It's a, it's a good question. So we, have discussed a, a couple approaches um there's in my mind right now there's two ways to go so i'm i'm really generally interested in political culture so the argument that we lay out in the book we could take the argument we developed around the political culture and try and see it applied to a different issue so for example lately we've seen um, the abortion rights movement adopts a lot of this freedom framing I said so they've moved away from pro-choice dialogue and you've seen a lot more you know co-opting the freedom framing um, so that would be a, a similar cultural argument to a different issue um, another perspective would be to go back to my roots which is more of a comparative sense so the same issue in different cultures right so uh, Switzerland for example is often cited in in the gun community as being a non-American but robust gun culture, and but it's it's a very different gun culture, yeah. right? and at least on the surface, it it seems to be a much more collectively oriented gun culture rather than an individual individualistic gun culture. So I'd personally be really fascinated to do some some work exploring that and explicitly comparing the two cultures. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen more um, uh, work coming out of uh, Israel, or at least people who are interested in studying Israeli gun culture, I mean, particularly in the last several months. But even before that, I, I had some communication back and forth with people who were interested in doing some comparative work. So I think that's, you know, different looking at diff different gun cultures cross nationally is really, really promising. Um, and, you know, to, to conclude, and I, I hate interviewers who do this to me, so I'm just getting revenge on all of them who did it to me. But, you know, were any any sort of parting thoughts, any anything that uh, you think is important to know about you or your work that we didn't already cover? Hey, you know, I, I don't think so. Um, I just I appreciate the opportunity to to get it out there. I, I, I don't uh, do much of this. I, I should probably do more of this sort of engagement. You you are an inspiration. You've been an inspiration for years with the amount of engagement on this issue that you do. Um, and I think a lot of academic, academics, myself included, don't do much of that. So I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate uh, talking to you. I feel like I've known you for years, I, so long that I don't even remember how we met, but I'm glad to to see you face to face and chat about your work. And, uh, you know, hopefully that it'll uh, bring some attention to it and get people thinking about you know, gun culture and guns in America in, in more nuanced, more complex and deeper ways, which, you know, I think that that does bring light over heat. So thanks for contributing to that effort.